The Bruins beat down the Maple Leafs as Toronto heads into the All-Star break on a low. Welcome into Rinkwide Toronto, sponsored by Bodog. Free casino games and sports odds. It is time to play at Bodog.net. Rob Wong joined alongside by David Alter. Comes to us from Scotiabank Arena, where the Maple Leafs fall 5-2 to the Boston Bruins in their last game before the All-Star break. And not the way that the Leafs wanted to head into the break, Dave. It uh, was going to be a tough matchup. We knew... Uh, The Bruins, of course, had come into this one, losers of three in a row, uh, which is very uncharacteristic for them pretty much all season long. Uh, They haven't lost four games in a row in quite a few years, I think it was. So uh, they definitely did not let it get to that point. But it's always tough with these games, whether it's against the Bruins, whether it's against the Lightning, you know, the Avalanche, any of the elite teams in the NHL. If the Leafs win, It's, well, let's see what happens come playoffs. And if they lose the game, it's, well, they're never going to win in the playoffs and they're never going to beat these teams. So we're not going to get into that discussion, of course, because I think there's going to be a lot of that out there. But just to take, you know, this one game sample against this uh, Bruins team, what did you make of it tonight? Yeah, you know, a little bit disappointed in the Maple Leafs. Uh, I really thought there was a quote that stuck out to me when we were in... I want to say it was Detroit. Yes, it was Detroit because they were in Detroit. Then they had the day off and then they played Boston last month. Right. So um, when we asked Sheldon Keefe, uh, how do you how do you uh, keep up in the race with Boston? He pretty much says there is no keeping up with them. And then I thought, you know, three game losing streak. Final game before the break, Leafs are kind of on an uptrend and without Austin Matthews, that if they could win without Austin Matthews, that would have made some sort of statement that they could feel good about their depth and a lot of different things. And and, um, there were just some real disappointing things that happened in that third period that just set a really awful tone. Uh, I actually didn't have a problem with much of the way the Leafs played for the first two periods. Um, But that third period, I mean... (sighs) I know that like I know David Camp is trying not to take a penalty there, but you can't stop playing when a guy is going in close because you're worried you're gonna take the penalty. Take the penalty. Keep it a one goal game. Like I don't know what was going on there. And uh from there just things kind of unraveled and uh there was some mixing and matching as a result of that at times. But um look, Boston is that good, and that's fair, but there was a real opportunity there to kind of show you over a lot of the other issues there. And I I think they missed it. And then what, what, what could have been a nine point deficit for the division and a real chase provided they go on a bit of a heater now seems even further out of reach. The whole four point swing kind of comes into my thought process there. Yeah, this one pretty much uh, cemented it, I think. If it wasn't already uh, a fait accompli that the Bruins were going to win the Atlantic, this one pretty much puts that thing to rest, barring just an absolute train wreck of a second half and the Maple Leafs going on an absolute heater to uh, catch them. But yeah, this game, uh, a tough one. You know, the first two matchups against the Bruins this year, both uh, one goal games, the uh, Leafs winning the first one, Boston winning the second one in Boston. So you thought... You know, maybe we would see more of that even without Austin Matthews and the Bruins, of course, dealing with some injuries as well. It's not as if they're, you know, uh, fully healthy, but they got most of their big guys. And hey, this one was close. You know, the first period, uh, the Maple Leafs, I thought, won that first period. Uh, The second period, of course, uh, the Bruins come out with the two to one lead after 40 minutes and then things went absolutely uh, haywire there in the third period for the Leafs. But they are chasing the game. They're trying to, you know, tie things up. But, you know, there were some positives uh, to take out of this one, I thought, but still uh, a lot of things that the Leafs need to work on. And we'll get to those here. But let's uh, kick things off hearing from head coach Sheldon Keefe, who says, no doubt the Bruins are a tough nut to crack. Well, I mean, you guys are watching the game. I mean, it's... (laughs) Last time we played them in their building, you know, uh, tie game with a few minutes left. Now it's a 2-1 game going to third period. Like, the margins are thin. But it, over the course of the season, I mean, it's it's significant. I mean, they just stay with it. Right? I mean, they're, they're 40 goals better than every team in the NHL. So it's it's a significant gap from between them and the rest of the, of the, of the league when you look at the – the season in its entirety uh, to this point, but uh, when you're in the game, you're right there, and it's, that's what 
that's what's tough, you know, because you certainly in Boston and then here again tonight, you know, we're, we're right there. Um, but the difference between being right there and winning the game and being on the other side of it, you know, that's that's significant. That's a, that's a significant challenge and hurdle. That team is, is dialed in and focused and, and competing and working uh, and make it, they make it hard. And I would say that's what really stood about out about the Bruins in this one, Dave, is that in the third period when they're up a goal, they're not sitting back and letting the Leafs take it to them and just hanging on for dear life. Like they're still, you know, pinching with their defensemen, having them up in the play, pressuring the Leafs at any opportunity that they could get. Like Boston definitely took it to the Leafs there uh, in the third. And, uh, you know, of course, the Leafs had to gamble. And uh, John Tavares says that they had to do that down a goal in the third period. Yeah, it's a little bit of give and take there. You gotta, you know, you know, try, try to, uh, you know, wanting wanting to uh, obviously, uh, you know, up our pace and our pressure and, and see if we can get numbers involved. Um, but trying to recognize uh, how quick the transitions can be. So um, that's a fine line. But uh, obviously, when we're in that spot down one, um, you know, obviously we have to look uh, to, to create. Uh, you know, you don't want to be reckless in forcing things. But uh, you know, we talked about how we can get more. Yeah, and that's the play you're talking about, Dave, the uh, David Camp uh, mistake there where he doesn't take the penalty and ends up letting A.J. Greer get free, and then he scores the goal to go up 3-1. Uh, to one. But, you know, you're in that spot, and, you know, Lilligren, um, you know, was a guy that was pinching all night long. In fact, all the Leafs D were, even, you know, when it was a closer game earlier, it seemed like a, a very uh, strategic thing that the Leafs defensemen were doing in this one. And in the third period, they they just got caught a couple of times, and unfortunately, it ended up in their net. Yeah, and look, I, I thought for the most part, the Leafs did a pretty good job of containing the Stars. Maybe they were over-focused on Boston Star players. I don't know. But one of the things that we've talked about a lot on this podcast when speculating about how the Leafs will perform in the playoffs is how do the Leafs' depth match up against, you know, other top teams' depth? Like how that fourth line in Tampa burned the Leafs in that series last year at times. And tonight, I'm looking down the goal sheet. You've got Pavel Zaka with two goals, A.J. Greer with a goal, Brandon Carlo with a goal. Derek Forbort with the goal. I mean, th- th- this is on the depth of the team, really. I mean, it's also that, you know, Mitch Marner is a minus four in this game as well. Doesn't help when you're kind of asked to do a lot and you're getting scored on in these situations. And some of the matchups are like these guys are doing it against some of your better players too at times. So, Look, you're right. It, like we don't overreact from one game, and for the most part, these could be things that they fix. But in some ways, this is bad that this type of effort is going to go a whole eight days to just kind of sit there and then probably not even be a memory when they go take on the Columbus Blue Jackets. Instead of just, you know, you're going to have that much time off. You're not going to comb through that the tape of that specific game at that point. You're looking at the task at hand, and that, that that should be a game they watch over and over again, go or at least a third period going into that playoffs, because a lot of the mistakes that the yesteryear Leafs have done kind of crept up in there. Perhaps Austin Matthews would have made it a little bit different. Of course, he's a he's a big time player for them, but uh, this is this is a significant difference here. Look, if the Leafs are going to go far. Even if they get past that first round, they're likely going to get Boston in round two, the way the standings kind of shape up right now. And um, this was a good, this was a good on notice game. And, you know, even when we talk about some of the opportunities, both sides, they had their chances, but they didn't break through. And uh, the goal scorers didn't score. And then they let non goal scorers score on them. And that's, that's not good. Yeah. You know, I, I like it's, it's so weird because as we said, it's not. A situation where you want to look at that third period or uh, look at this game and say, you know, the Leafs can't compete with the Bruins because those first two games, as Sheldon Keefe said, they're one goal games. They're so tight. Yeah. The first 40 minutes, again, it's a one goal game. It's really just that third period, I think, uh, will be stuck in the mind of a lot of people because that's, you know, the last part of the game that 
you saw and you saw, you know, Rasmus Sandin and Timothy Lilligren on the ice for a bunch of goals. You saw Ilya Samsonov give up some uh, goals that uh, maybe he should have stopped. So um, it's going to be etched in people's minds, unfortunately, for these next eight days. And there's going to be a lot of talk about um, what happened in this one, but specifically in, you know, that that third period uh, where things really got away and uh, some of the goals in the second period um, as well. So as I said, uh, some positives, but a bunch of negatives to talk about. And I think, you know, one of the big conversations that's going to happen uh, on Thursday and uh, for a few days, in fact, is the pairing of Rasmus Sandin and Timothy Lilligren, which all season long has been really, really good. They've had moments. You know, every deep pair has its moments where things don't go their way. But tonight specifically, uh, Boston was really able to take it to them uh, in their own end. They got hemmed in their own zone at one point for two and a half minutes on the Brandon Carlo goal. Uh, Rasmus Sandin, of course, uh, coughing the puck up in his own zone for another goal. Not a banner night for these two guys. And you don't want to overreact to this one matchup and say, boy, you don't want them out there against the Boston Bruins because... The reality is this is going to be at worst your third pairing come the playoffs. Like you're not uh, going to be moving these guys necessarily or trading them. Like I don't think that would be the case. Like I've heard some people say, well, you got Jordy Ben and Connor Timmons waiting in the wings. Like, would you throw those guys in there? Like, no, I'm not putting those guys in over these two. Um, they have shown over the whole season that they are really good players. You know, maybe the Leafs need to do a better job of managing their situations and who they go up against. And I would say more so Sandine than, than Lilligren. I think I trust Lilligren pretty much against anyone uh, at this point with how good he has fared. But uh, what did you make of that duo tonight and, and moving forward here? Yeah, it was really interesting how they were kind of deployed. Like um, whenever Sheldon Keith has had this optimal look with the top six here, he seems to like not really have a third line. They just kind of rotate in and out. Um, and there was a lot of shifting in that regard in terms of their assignments from the beginning to the end of the game. I think it was what the situation called for because there were times where, you know, someone like TJ Brody got exposed for one of the goals that I noticed, uh, Morgan Riley as well. Um, so they moved things around. Then, um, Jordano Hall, which is supposed to be the mid pair kind of moves to, play lower minutes that the second pair and the third pair are kind of the same. Um, yeah. So it was interesting. Like I, I, I feel like that is a good line as a third pair, but maybe they're overplaying them in that situation. And I think it speaks to the confidence that they have, but maybe this would have been a situation where Jordano and Hall should have played a little bit more. Cause I thought they were the better tandem tonight. So, um, it's kind of interesting how it played out. Uh, I know they want to continue to build the confidence level for uh, Sandine and Lilligren, and they're going to really need to be good going down the road. But I also think that this kind of makes a good case that maybe you need a bit more clarity in terms of what your defense pairs are, whether you would define them or not. Because uh, just having an equal spread doesn't seem to be an optimal situation against really good teams when the firepower isn't necessarily equal. There's different matchups, different assignments that call for different things. And I think the Leafs got burned a little bit here with that. Yeah, I think come playoff time, I agree with you. It's going to be more defined and you're going to be more uh, matchup dependent, maybe not to the point like, you know, we saw Mike Babcock back in the day where it was just like, only these people play against these people. Like you still want to take advantage of those things. But uh, as you said, you know, Mark Giordano and Justin Hall, I thought were the, the best Leafs pairing on D tonight. And I think, you know, in a seven game series, whether it's Tampa Bay or whether it gets the Boston Bruins, those are the two guys I want to have out there uh, more often than not. And you're going to pick your spots with the, the other four guys uh, out there. But we've seen, you know, different combinations too. We've seen, you know, Mark Giordano with uh, Timothy Lilligren as a pair. Uh, that works as well. And you've got the Brody Giordano pairing if you ever want to go to that uh, and you need to break glass in case of emergency. Uh, so Sheldon Keefe does have his options. But as we've said numerous times, you know, the whole upgrade on defense, this is your six. And unless you're getting, you know, someone big time like a Jacob Chikrin comes in or a Jake McCabe, like at that point, yeah, then I'm thinking about maybe moving someone out. Um, but if you're bringing in, you know, no offense to Luke Shen or, you know, an Ilya Labushkin type that I, I think a lot of people are looking for, 
I'm not taking Justin Hall out of the lineup for Ilya Labushkin, and I'm not taking Timothy Lilligren or Rasmus Sandin out of the lineup for those types of guys. Like, you know, uh, I get what they bring to the table and they bring that uh, physicality, um, but just the overall total game, like that's just one part of it. Um, and sure, Rasmus Sandin's never going to be like a big time physical type of guy. He can, you know, throw the occasional uh, reverse hit and things like that. Uh, but this team needs guys on the back end that can move the puck right that was the biggest issue at the beginning of the season the d were not able to get the forwards the puck and they were having a lot of trouble uh eventually they righted the ship and they figured that out um but yeah i'm not sure a guy that's banging it off the glass uh every time they get the puck in their own zone is what this team really needs at this point so um hey maybe they do it and i'm gonna look like an idiot but uh, i just can't see that uh really happening right now here's what i'll say when they do go to the trade deadline and March 3rd passes, I just want to see, barring injury, of course, a consistent rollout of what their lines and things look like. No more mixing and matching. And I think I think it's imperative for the Leafs to know what they are going in and stop constantly adjusting. Like I, I get it now. You kind of have to see what you have. You're deep. You have all these things. It makes sense. The construct of your team could change with trade deadline. Once you have that, figure out what your game is, figure out what your lines are, have them clearly defined so that they can play, know what their assignment is, and play. I see that from Boston. I see that there's just, everyone knows what the role is. They go, they go, they go. And there isn't, sometimes you're up here, sometimes you're down here. Like, I think the Leafs kind of have to ramp up and just not have the constant shuffle. And look, I mean, even last year, like little things, like Timothy Lilligren, he struggled after game one, we didn't see him again. Wayne Simmons played, like, I think two games in the playoffs, didn't see him again. These weren't necessarily injury-related things. These were constant adjustments that, yeah, you might need every now and then, but not this much. I think it just behooves the Leafs from the playoffs going forward, once they know what their team is, Barring injury, of course, because injuries are going to happen. Have your lines defined. Know what you want to do. Stop moving it. Get everyone on board and just play hard, play fast. Carve out your identity. Be strong, structured defensively. They, they've shown glimpses of being good defensively all, all season long. That's been their biggest improvement. But it's starting to get away from them a little bit against these top-tier opponents. And that that's reminding me of yesteryear Leafs. And I think they've just kind of have to go back to that identity, but also just have a consistent know what their lineup is. It may be less exciting for us, but I think that will actually be better for them in the long run for a deep run. Yeah, and I'm with you from the standpoint that there are certain guys, at least in the bottom six, that I want to see get consistent run. And, you know, Bobby McMahon had a great start, like a great first four or five games. And uh, has definitely hit a brick wall of late. Uh, maybe, you know, put in some minutes that were a little bit too challenging for him at this stage of his career. Uh, we saw Wayne Simmons get in there tonight. And, you know, I guess we can have that conversation. He was in there, obviously, for a reason and uh, knocked out A.J. Greer with a great punch uh, right after the guy scored a goal. Uh, a little bit bittersweet, I guess, for A.J. Greer. Uh, one second, you're celebrating the goal. The next uh, yeah. moment, you're taking a big right cross to the chin. And uh, you got to go to the quiet room to get checked out uh, by the concussion spotter. But, you know, I get that, you know, they're putting Wayne Simmons in these spots and, you know, looking for a little bit of energy. And there were some moments tonight I thought he was uh, effective. There was a play in the game where, you know, he battled Hampus Lim home for a puck and was able to strip him and, and got a scoring chance out of it. But I thought most of the game... Wayne Simmons, and this has sort of been the issue all season long, just does not have the foot speed to keep up in a lot of yeah. matchups right now. And, you know, when he's behind the play, that really puts the team um, at a disadvantage. So I think that's kind of where I'm at with you. It's, you know, whether it's Bobby McMahon, Joey Anderson, um, you know, Zach Aston Reese is back in the lineup now. Like, just give these guys a full run. And let's see what happens. And I think, you know, for a lot of these guys in the bottom six, they want to find chemistry too with line mates. You know, you know they don't want to keep coming in and out. And maybe there is some sort of, 
psychology behind it. I think we've talked about it before where, you know, you're trying to keep these guys hungry and you want people coming in that, you know, want to try to win a spot come playoff time. But, um, you know, at some point you just need to go with what you have here so you can start feeling comfortable uh, about these guys come playoff time. I mean, if you're going to keep switching guys in and out, uh, heading into the playoffs, into the final, you know, few weeks, it's like, well, do you know who you trust the most, right? Like in those situations, right. not saying that, you know, you go into the playoffs with one group and you never change anyone. That never happens. You, we see teams make adjustments all the time, game to game, series to series. But um, just for right now with, you know, some of these guys in the bottom six that I've thought have shown a little something, whether it's a Bobby McMahon or Joey Anderson, give them an extended run and, and let's see what happens. Yeah, look, I, I think that's going to happen, but I, I just I want to see once the trade deadline goes and whatever the changes they make, whether it's addressing the top six or or depth defensemen or what have you, or or landing a big fish if that's even a possibility. Have your team be what they are and just roll that out consistently from March fourth. I think March fourth is the first game back. Yeah, yeah, or maybe it's March 5th, Mark, because I know it's an off day. Um, but just do that and then roll it till the end of the season and just stick with it and and, and uh, make sure that your team is ramping up and you're not still figuring out what your team is in April. And I feel like a lot of times that's that's been a shortcoming of the Toronto Maple Leafs that there just aren't clearly defined roles in the bottom six or whatever the case may be or adjustments or, Oh, Hey, this guy's not ready for it. So we have to pull him out. You should know if he's ready for it. Like, yeah, if there's mistakes, you, do you really want a knee jerk reaction? Like, I don't know. Like, look, Timothy Lilligren was great when he was paired with Mark Giordano. Then the, the hook was pretty quick after he was either game one or game two. I think it was game two and that was it. And so, Look, I get you have to do those things every now and then, but it was a 1-1 series at that time, right? It wasn't like uh, they're down to nothing. You got to make a panic move. Like, stick to what works and don't react. Uh, just let let your staff build confidence and, and build it, but know what they are. Like, if, if a fourth line is going to burn the Leafs again, that's going to be a real problem. Like, it really will be, and that should should not happen at all. Like, yeah, your store, your scores need to score and all those other things, but you've got to have a tight, sound defense and know what they are. And I think even in the beginning of the season, Sheldon Keith said they were looking for a bit of a different look on the fourth line, figure that out. But it's clear they don't know what that is yet. Yeah, and at the same token, as you said, um, you know, Timothy Lilligren last year getting pulled uh, in that series against the Lightning. Maybe they should have kept it going. As much as we talked about the struggles with those two guys in this one tonight, Sandine and Lilligren, like I hope they get more opportunities here down the stretch against top competition just to see, you know, how it is and give them an opportunity to prove that they can handle those types of minutes. Because if you just go now and say, okay, you know what, we're never putting them out there again against uh, guys like Bergeron, Marchand, and Pasternak, like you're not going to learn anything. Um, these guys need to get that experience and uh, learn from their mistakes. That's the only way you can figure things out. So uh, hopefully the coaching staff uh, puts them right back out there in some of these situations moving forward. But the Maple Leafs fall 5-2 to the Boston Bruins coming up on rink-wide Toronto. We'll get to the goaltending tonight, Ilya Samsonov. We'll talk about Michael Bunting, who is always in the action and uh, got to give a letter grade for the unofficial first half of the Maple Leafs season. You're listening to Rink-Wide Toronto, sponsored by Bodog, free casino games and sports odds. It's time to play at Bodog.net. It's Rink-Wide Toronto, pregame, postgame, every game. Nasland. We weren't afraid of facing any line or any deep pairing because we knew that we would generate offense. Bertuzzi. I was like, I can play in this league and I can play a big role in this league and I can be dominant. If all the stars align. Morrison. There was a confidence that we believed if we went out and played the way we were capable, we could score every shift. Their story in their words. Unreal West Coast Express. Available on January 31st on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. 
Nearly 2.5 billion people are shopping online globally, and a lot of that shopping has been done on mobile phones. So how does your business website look and function on a mobile phone? Hey, it's Ray Ferraro. Right now, my friends at North Beach, along with their partners at Craft Growth, are offering small business owners and entrepreneurs a free website digital audit. So you can find out if your website is properly optimized for a great mobile phone shopping experience. E-commerce has never been more important. So visit craftgrowth.net and get your free digital audit. That's craftgrowth.net. It is Rinkwide Toronto, sponsored by Bodog, the place to play free casino games and get the latest sports odds. Rob Wong, joined alongside by David Alter, comes to us from Scotiabank Arena, Leafs losing 5-2 to the Boston Bruins in their final game before the All-Star break. Time for the Bodog line of the day, and the Bruins currently massive favorites to win the Atlantic Division. So much so, I would not recommend putting a wager on them. It reminds me of, uh, was it a few weeks ago in the NFL playoffs, some guy put down like a million dollars to win $11,000 in playoff games and he lost. Like that's the type of return we're talking about right now. You'd have to put down a lot of coin. I don't know. Someone that's just got money to blow. Uh, Maybe they put too many zeros by accident uh, on their uh, sportsbook app. But uh, at the end of the day, the Bruins uh, look like they are going to be cruising to uh, another Atlantic Division title here. So when you look at the Leafs, Dave, they are unlikely to win the division. Is it time to start prepping the team for the Lightning in round number one? Do you look at the trade deadline as an opportunity to you know, kind of set things up. If we're using sort of like a, a baseball uh, parlance here, you're trying to set your rotation for uh, that first round playoff series. I'm so mixed about what the Leafs are going to do here. And like, I'll explain. We all know that Kyle Dubas is in the final year of his contract, right? And so it seems like because of the confidence in himself that he's, even though he probably should because the Leafs want it, he's probably not going to mortgage the future of the team. And what what I mean by that is he's not going to go against some of the other things that he's kind of held steady about like he did, la- like he did last year, which is like not risking the first round pick in the draft. Things like that. Granted, the first round pick became a second round pick later and they got rid of Peter Morazic, but it was kind of different. Um... So, yeah, they can make some moves here, but look at what the Vancouver Canucks just pulled. They got exactly what they wanted from the Islanders, and the the asking price was matched. It's been the reported price of a big fish. And it's kind of hard. Like, you could believe in your group all you want, but when you've got the juggernaut that is the Bruins and you want to go deep, I don't know how you don't throw everything at this year unless you've just resigned yourself to the fact that this year ain't the year, but then you have other things to answer for if that's what you've resigned yourself to. So this is tough. Like, I don't know. I I think they should have the first round pick at play and, and go after things that I think would substantially prove this improve this team but it's got to be like more than just character like Nick Felino was it's got to be like a bona fide top six yeah you want him on the team it's going to improve every aspect of the game that you guys play and you have enough runway to kind of go but it's going to cost them and I just don't know if the Leafs feel like they can do that right now under Kyle Dubas I feel like he's going to hold steady and he's going to live and die by this group and if that means he's not back next year, he's not back next year, but then it's just a hamster wheel. So I could be completely wrong on that, but I just don't see him. He could pull off some things, but I just don't see him throwing everything at this upcoming year like you would think like a GM in the final year of his contract would do in this situation. Yeah, I think he's got, uh, you know, too much respect for the position and he always has that long term view to just completely, you know, go crazy, Uh, even though I think, you know, in some aspects he should and, and crazy in the sense that, you know, he probably should go out and give up whatever it takes to get a Timo Meyer or that type of, you know, top line star forward. But, you know, I think I feel the same way that I did last year for the Leafs heading in the playoffs. And, you know, when they get to that point, if they can just get through the first round, I mean, I think all bets are off at that point, like just to get that 
monkey off your back of not having to answer those questions anymore. It's that sort of you know sense of relief, I think, just would do a lot psychologically um, for this group. And that's not to say the Leafs get past the first round, they're winning the cup because they most likely have to play, play the Bruins and that's not going to be easy. But at that point, you're kind of playing with house money, right? Like you lose in the second round of the Bruins, everyone's going to say, oh, well, that's tough. It's the best team in the NHL. But if you lose in the first round, like all the same stuff happens all over again. Not saying a first round win is a success for this group and success for this franchise. Like they have bigger aspirations. Um, but just getting over that hurdle, I think, would do a lot. So, you know, if I'm Kyle Dubas, I'm trying to do as much as I can to beat Tampa in that first seven game series. And whatever happens after that, happens but that has to be your focus like as weirdly as that sounds um it shouldn't necessarily be you know what do i need to do to go on a long run here it's what do i need to do get out of the first round and then you know the wherever the chips fall uh are going to be where they fall because there are still uh, enough talented guys on this team to to get the job done of course they are built for the long run i would say uh with a lot of their core pieces and you look at the way the goaltending is played this year but it's not a finished product they you know have weaknesses as we've seen and uh, hopefully those are addressed by the uh, trade deadline but uh, unfortunately tonight one of the weaknesses was in goal. Ilya Samsonov really struggling after a strong first period. Dave uh, had a couple of goals, probably wanted back. Of course, uh, making a lot of starts right now with Matt Murray uh, injured. Joseph Wall, of course, was the uh, backup tonight. But Samsonov says, uh, despite feeling okay in this one, he has been feeling a little under the weather. How do you feel physically? It's been a long, a lot of games in a short period of time for you. Nah, I feel good. I try to prepare my body for uh, uh, for every game. Yes, I will talk with the goalie coach and uh, it's, uh, doctor staff is helping for me too. Yeah, I feel feel good, feel good. What impact does it have on you when you miss the a practice, the team practice? I know you work with Curtis, but does it have any impact on you when you miss the team practice? I feel a little bit hurt, my calf and uh, a little bit. I don't know how to say. Cushions? Cushions, yeah. No, nose and uh, cough. Oh, yeah. Congestion. Oh, yeah. Yeah. under the weather. Yeah, that's why I'm lost. Yeah. And uh, that was the voice of our own David Alter, Russian translator for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Yeah. yeah, no, so like uh, I was uh, asking him because he he didn't know how to explain what symptoms he had. So he revealed that he was a little bit sick. That's what I said at the end there. Um, and he agree- he he agreed. He said, yeah. Um, they, I guess I can understand why Sean Keefe didn't want to reveal that when Keefe was asked about it after the game. He said, it's February in Ontario. Everyone's battling something, <laughs> including myself. So he's not wrong on that. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so it's, uh, you know, we've talked about things kind of going around the room, but I guess they didn't want the opposing team knowing that the goalie is sick in that regard. But, um, yeah, so, that that explains why he didn't take part in a full practice because in my previous conversations with Samsonov, he actually likes usually facing some of the shots in those practices because it could replicate game situations. And when you go a couple of days without replicating game situations like that, you could be a little rusty. Now, that first period he wasn't. I think he was a lot of the reason why that game was tied. I mean, Allmark was just as good on the other side. But some of those saves, man, in that first period... Uh, were were quite something else, and um, it looked like the type of goaltending you need against a team like the Bruins. Really, you need a goalie to kind of steal you games when you're just not sharp early on. And he, it looked like he was doing that at least at first. Yeah, a couple you probably would have liked to have back some of the long range shots from just inside the blue line come to mind, but um, it understandable. He's been sick. Um, but also seven games in 15 days uh, or eight, eight games in 15 days, actually, if you count the appearance as well or 16 days, like, it's a lot. He's never had to do that. I think he's done five games in 10 days twice with the Capitals last season, but that was the most in terms of workload there. So um, yeah, they kind of pushed him through, got him what he needed to do now. And we'll see how he is coming out of the break. Joseph Wall and Pontus Holmberg return to the Marley, so they'll stay fresh. But other than that, it'll just be seeing how Sam Sonov comes back from this and uh, 
see where Matt Murray is with his ankle because that's still the big mystery right now in terms of the goalie situation. Yeah, it's crazy to think that a uh, goalie making seven straight starts is like being overworked, but that's just the state of you know where goaltending is at these days. You don't have guys making you know seventy starts a year anymore, uh, especially on this team where the the Murray Samsonov tandem has been. Really strong, not of late, with Murray uh, dealing with his ankle injury, of course, and Samsonov on this uh, great role. But uh, perfect timing for him just to get a break here, get the the next eight days off, and just get to relax and be on the mend. And hopefully, uh, by that time, Matt Murray is able to return as well because the Leafs come out of the break on a uh, back-to-back against the Columbus Blue Jackets. So unlikely that uh, Samsonov would get both of those games. It's either going to be Samsonov and Murray or uh, maybe Joseph Wall uh, is still with the team at that point and you know makes one of those starts. But uh, no complaints uh, about Samsonov on this run. Tough game tonight. And uh, as we heard, they're feeling under the weather. And uh, that's never going to be easy when you got to take on a team like the uh, Boston Bruins. And when you got congestion as well, I mean, just that feeling of <laughs> like you can't breathe yeah, like, I got it right of, now. Yeah, that's a little important when you feel like you can't breathe and you got to, you know, play a National Hockey League game. That's not the uh, easiest thing to do. So um, he started off well, uh, did not end well, unfortunately. But uh, like I said, gets a nice. You ever use those breathe right strips? I've never uh, used I have them used them before. Uh, yeah, they they do work. Um, so, you know, maybe that's okay. what he should have done. But, uh, you know, probably just some maybe I should medicine. do it. Yeah, maybe just some cough medicine. I think that would help. Decongestion uh, medicine that will uh, clear things up uh, a little bit. Michael Bunting, uh, meanwhile, in the mix in this one, as you'd expect, Dave, uh, never a guy that shies away from, uh, you know, the, the, you know, dirty stuff in uh, hockey games. Brad Marchand, of course, has made a career of it. And Michael Bunting in a, in a similar vein, not the uh, same high end elite talent as a uh, Marchand, but was all over the place tonight. And, there were some interesting moments where he tried to, you know, get a call. It didn't go his way. One on Marshan that looked like a penalty with Marshan hauling him down. Uh, there was another one where he took a hit to the face and was bleeding, uh, wiped the blood off of his nose and started waving it at the ref. I don't think uh, I've ever seen that before. Uh, but let's hear from Mitch Marner, who was asked his thoughts on whether or not the refs should have given his uh, line mates some of the calls tonight. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. So you got to ask. Well, I guess we can't ask any of them. I don't know. I mean, it's hard for us to see it on the bench, but um, obviously he's bleeding, you know. Um, but I don't know. It's up to the refs. It's not up to us. We're just trying to play hockey out there and trying to do our thing. And obviously how Mike plays is around that net a lot. Um, you know, he draws a lot around that net, but, um, you know, it's hard for everyone to kind of see the play. Yeah, I love the realization there, Marner, at the beginning. He's like, well, you'll have to ask yeah. them. Oh, wait, you, you can't talk to the refs and you can't ask them what they were thinking. But, you know, this is sort of the, the fine line that Michael Bunting walks, right? Because he's in there. We know from time to time, let's be honest, he does uh, embellish the calls, but that's why he's able to draw them, you know, a la Nazem Kadri uh, as a Toronto Maple Leaf and still as a Calgary Flame, like he was notorious for doing that. But on the other hand, you know, when you do that a little bit too much, the refs are weary of those things, and sometimes they won't give you the benefit of the doubt. And, you know, maybe it's because he was a little too vocal about that tonight. The refs, you know, felt like they weren't going to uh, give him what he wanted. Um, but uh, tonight, definitely uh, a situation where uh, Michael Bunting maybe took it a little bit too far. Maybe he got a little bit out there uh, trying to, to draw some of these calls. What do you think? Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, um, it's funny that third period, you know, apart from the fight and the roughing there, uh, it looked like they were just whistles in the pockets type situation. Now, I, I think that, that bunting thing happened late in the second with the blood, but, um, yeah, so like, uh, you know, apart from that, it's, uh, it's interesting. I, I don't know. He does ride the line a lot. And he does a lot of what I think Austin Matthews got in trouble with a couple of years back where he shows up the officials and like, well, like while I get his frustration, like him doing the waving blood thing is not going to help with his reputation. Like, it's just not like anytime you're cut and memed and, and like you do things like that where you like, you're kind of showing up the officials, it's human nature. They're not going to like it and they're going to remember it especially if you come across that official again. And I'm not saying it's fair or unfair. Like, I do I do get it. Um, but, um, yeah, you just, you can't, um, 
you can't kind of do those those kind of things. And you know, I looked at it again with the Carlo hit. It kind of looks like it's his own stick, even though Carlo is the aggressor there. So maybe that why that's why it didn't get called. Still should have been some sort of penalty. Mm-hmm. Um, but look, I think it speaks to uh the that there's no transparency when it comes to this kind of stuff and a lot of subjectivity comes into play when you're when you have a reputation attached to you and sometimes uh the political game of how you play the officials is just as equal as the play on the ice and the teams that do it best are the ones that have the most success it seems yeah and i think it's a situation as you said you know the refs don't want to be shown up but they don't want to be taken advantage of i think that's really the thing right like you if you're gonna uh, faint a penalty every time there's any sort of contact like sure they're going to call the occasional one but if it's consistent over and over again especially in the same game like at some point they're just going to be like it's the boy who cried wolf right like they're just going to be like okay you got hit probably but you were also doing that earlier when there was nothing going on so like i'm you know you're not going to take advantage of me here like i'm not going to uh, bail you out and give you that call so um you know michael bunting still one of the you know, best players in the league at drawing penalties. Like that, that's definitely a, a skill um, that he has. But tonight, uh, it just just seemed like the refs were on very much high alert, and they know the stakes of this game. It's a divisional matchup. It's against two rivals. Like you know, they're going to be more aware of the the physicality or what have you. They're they're you know going to be keeping an eye on this one. It definitely felt like a playoff game uh, in a lot of stretches. So. Uh, it, it could have just been a situation, like you said, they pocketed the whistles. This one, they weren't going to call a lot of stuff, and they were probably going to let a lot of things go and let the players decide it. But uh, maybe a few moments here or there where uh, things should have gone the Leafs' way, but uh, unfortunately for Michael Bunting, they did not. All right, got a few minutes left, maybe about 10 minutes here. So let's talk about this first half because we are at the uh, unofficial first half of the uh Maple Leaf season and yeah. you know let's let's give more out a couple of half. more than first half we were past the the 41 uh game mark but let's give out some awards uh let's do that I mean the Oscars are right around the corner right was that this Sunday I think uh coming up I might oh, be mistaken I had no idea I'm not a big like uh, Oscar guy it usually just happens and it's like oh it's that time of year uh but I usually uh, find out on Twitter when people are tweeting about it. I'm like oh that's on Okay, well, I shouldn't and have said that at all. It, uh, it is not Oscars weekend. <laughs> I just looked it up. It's not for another month. Wow, what is it? it just shows what you uh, March 12th. What, what award so, season uh, is it now? Oh, okay. Oh, it's so What it's award nothing. season is it I'm, now? Is it the nothing. Grammy I'm season off. now? Mm, Aren't the Grammys in February? Uh, I know the American right. Music Awards are in January. Uh, maybe you know, the American oh, you're Music right. Award- no, you are right. It's the Grammys this weekend. That's what I was thinking of. It's not wow. the Oscars. Look at, so look look at, at you, Mr. Award Expert. And I totally just remember by chronological memory. I just remember that the American Music Awards are always in January. And those are always like the lesser of the two where they like try to one up the Grammys by doing something uh, special to be like, hey, we're still the, we're still important awards like uh, for the American. Like, it's just it's kind of funny when really only when anyone ever talks or remembers the Grammys. I love the AMAs. They're like sneaky good usually. And the only reason I know that they're in January, as you said, is because I remember uh, going to Vegas for the New Year's game against the uh, Golden Knights, the Maple Leafs and Golden Knights, and I was there. Oh yeah. And the AMAs were taking place that weekend, and I was like, oh cool, uh, the AMAs are in Vegas, and I didn't go, uh, did not buy tickets, was not interested in that. But uh, that's uh, neither here nor there. Anyways, we wanted to get to the uh, midseason awards uh, that we're going to hand out here. So let's go just. You know, easy by position. Uh, let's start with the goalie, Matt Murray, Ilya Samsonov. You know, at one point, it was a pretty tight battle, I would say, for for top goaltender. But I think it's pretty clear right now who gets the uh, midseason nod for uh, goaltender of the first half for the Maple Leafs, right? Yeah, yeah it certainly looks like it's going to be Ilya Samsonov going forward for a little bit. But of course, you know, there were those flashes of, hey, would like this back and things can change in an instant. My prediction going into this was that Sam Sonov was going to kind of take the lead in that regard, just given his recent experience and having less of an injury question than Matt Murray going into the season. And so far, that has played itself the way it has. But it's a great button that they need to push if Sam Sonov struggles in the first one or two or three playoff games that they can pull the playoff. They can push the playoff experience button and activate it if they need to, and then anyone can just kind of go on a run when needed. And certainly that's 
something that Matt Murray's done a couple times in his career. So um, that's why they have him here. Like a playoff experience was paramount in addition to everything else. And so Samsonov is the guy right now, for sure. He is definitely the guy. Yeah, no uh, doubt about that right now. Leo Samsonov has been the uh, best Maple Leafs goalie of the first half. Moving uh, up to the decor here, I think uh, a few podcasts ago, we talked about you know Mark Giordano being uh, the linchpin of this uh, defense core. And while I think he definitely has been, I'm going to give my nod to Timothy Lilligren. I-, I just think, you know, despite tonight, which was not a particularly good game, I've seen a, a lot of growth. Uh, with him this year and maybe Giordano is the the safe choice but I'll go with the the upside that I think there's still uh, a lot more there with Lily Grin so uh, Timmy uh, is my pick on the uh, defense side of things who's your top D-man of the first half for the Maple Leafs I would definitely give Timothy Lilligren the most improved award for sure if there was such a thing uh, for the defense I am going to go with Giordano just because I truly feel that Uh, things would have gone off the rails quickly. and We'd be talking about a bubble to non-playoff team had Mark Giordano not stepped in when the defense was dropping like flies and really kind of take the number one defense role by the horns and kind of have to be a throwback where he could have easily fallen apart at age 39 and didn't do that. And for those reasons, uh, I have to give it to him because I think... If he was gone, in addition to all those three, it would have been a disaster. As good as Lilligren, uh, Sandine, and and Hall to an extent were, I think Giordano was was a stabilizing force that that avoided the Leafs a lot of trouble early on. For that reason, I'm giving it to him. All right, and finally the forward core. You know, Mitch Marner has garnered a lot of the attention this year. Uh, was the all-star selected before uh, Austin Matthews was voted in by the fans. He, of course, is not going to Florida due to the uh, injury. But I think right now it's pretty much a two-horse race, uh, a coin flip maybe, whether it's Mitch Marner or William Nylander. Who are you going with as the uh, Maple Leafs' top forward of the first half of the season? You know, obviously during the point streak, I would have said Mitch Marner. He was doing a lot of different things. It was kind of crazy, but I think William Nylander has just edged them out with how hot he's been. Um, And I think, you know, maybe today, maybe that'll change after today, but before the game against the Bruins, I thought it spoke about highly about how well his two, two way play is, has improved that when Austin Matthews went down, that they, they didn't overload with Mitch Marner moving to the top line. Uh, Instead of Mitch Marner, they had Nylander be the driver of the second line instead of Mitch Marner. And that that's a really important vote of confidence in, in those situations when you know your one line is going to be what it is. And then, you know, you move Kerfoot into the middle. You've got um, Callie Arncroke on the left, but then you need a core guy that's really going to drive that line. And usually that would go to Marner because Marner has been that player. But for them to kind of go Nylander, I think, said that as of right now, that he was the guy. Now, that could change after tonight, like I said, but uh, I have to give the edge to Nylander just because of that. Yeah, I think I'm with you as well. You know, if you'd asked me maybe last week or the week before that, Mitch Marner, probably the no-brainer, but uh, William Nylander's stretch of late has just, you know, vaulted in past Marner slightly here, and it's not a slight on Mitch Marner at all. Like, he's had an incredible season, the point streaks. Both very good. um, both very good, and the Maple Leafs would not be where they are with either one of these guys. But I think, you know, we've seen it this year with William Nylander. Um, I forget what the exact number is, but, you know, game score is one of those advanced stats that people kind of look at as, um, you know, a total stat for for how players perform game to game. And Nylander's been, you know, I think almost 20 times the, the best Maple Leaf uh, in their games this year. So, like, almost half of their games, he's been their top guy. And I just think... You can see it on the numbers. You can see it on the eye test. Like the guy's having a phenomenal season. He's on pace for, you know, like 45 goals this year. So um, who knows where they would be without him. Mitch Marner's been incredibly valuable, but I think William Nylander edges him by a hair uh, just for me. So to wrap it all up here, Dave, your uh, letter grade for the Toronto Maple Leafs at the unofficial first half of the season. A minus. And just like want me to give you a reason why. Yeah. Like, look, they've improved. They've done a lot of things. They look really good. Uh, the goaltending has performed better than I expected. 
Uh, the defense, for the most part, has improved. Um, there's a lot of different things, but that minus is for those moments where it looks like they're outmatched against top opponents. And then even more recently, the Ottawa's and the Montreal's, when they have those reminders of where they just don't get up in those situations, it reminds me of the same old Leafs in a lot of different ways. So I, that's where the minus comes in. But that's my letter grade for them. See, I don't want to disagree with you uh, because I think you make a lot of valid points there. Like, how can I give the team that currently has the third most points in the league like a B plus? Like, that just seems unfair. But the only reason I'm going to go there maybe is because, like you said, um, you know, there's still been a lot of moments this season. B plus that, and A uh, minus are not that different. They're not that different. Uh, but, you know, that stretch to begin the season was pretty horrific. You got to give them credit for getting out of it, of course, with that uh, great run from November to like the middle of December. And they've, you know, still uh, been really strong here. But it, it just feels like there are still parts of their game that that needs some work. And as we said, they're they're not a complete team. So uh, B plus feels pretty harsh, like even throwing that grade out there. But just to be different, I'm going to make that uh, my letter grade. So B plus, A minus, like you said, it's still within that uh, range. So I think that's uh, pretty fair. But uh, difference of like you know. three percentage points when you think of it. Right. But I look, if you had said to people after that Anaheim game earlier this year that the Leafs, you know, February 1st would have the third best points, uh, third uh, most amount of points in the league this year. Uh, I didn't think anybody would have believed you. I thought people, you know, people would have been like, what the heck happened, you know, from this terrible right. game against the Ducks to this point. So they have had an incredible turnaround. So, uh, you know, crap on me all you want. B plus probably too harsh, but uh, just taking a look at it uh, objectively, maybe there's some things about uh, this team that still kind of stick in my craw uh, a little bit, but uh, we shall see what the second half of the season brings us we hope you join us here on rink wide toronto the next post game show won't be until next friday when the maple Leafs visit the columbus blue jackets for the first half of a home and home coming out of the all-star break make sure you like review and subscribe to the pod wherever you get your favorite pods you can follow us on twitter at rink wide tor at d alter and at rob wong three four you can always get the pod at rink wide toronto Dot com for David Alter and producer Aaron. I'm Rob Wong. You've been listening to Rinkwide Toronto, sponsored by Bodog, Canada's home for casino games and sports odds, where everyone goes to play. You've been listening to Rinkwide Toronto pregame, postgame, every game. Hey, it's Ray Ferraro and Darren Drager from the Rain Drakes Hockey Podcast. Drakes, we're getting into your favorite part of the year. It's insider season. Yeah, the March 3rd trade deadline is in sight, and general managers' phones are ringing as front offices are trying to figure out what they're doing, buyers, sellers, and the storylines, right? And the trade rumors, they're blowing up now across the league. Yeah, we got it all covered, Drakes, along with the top hockey guests, twice weekly, here on the Ray and Drakes Hockey Podcast. Check us out everywhere you get your podcasts.